Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Odsley. I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator for the Vermont Studio Center. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm really excited for this reading. Um, it is a reading designed um, in our new virtual programming called the Writer to Writer series, and it pairs two writers in conversation with each other, both about their work and their life as working writers. Tonight we have two authors with us, and I'm so pleased to introduce them. So for our official bios tonight, Sebastian Matthews is the author most recently of the memoir, Beyond Repair, Living in a Fractured State, and of the memoir, In My Father's Footsteps, as well as two poetry collections, We Generous and Miracle Day, both um, from Red Hen Press. A third collection, Beginner's Guide to a Head-On Collision, also came out from Red Hen Press in 2017. Along with Stanley Plumley, Matthews is the co-editor of three volumes, The Blue Poetry Blues, Essays and Interviews of William Matthews, Search Party, The Collected Poems of William Matthews, a runner-up for, for the Pulitzer Prize, and New Hope for the Dead, Uncollected Matthews. Sebastian also serves uh, as a trustee on the, for the Vermont Studio Center, and we are very, very grateful to have him um, on our board of trustees, and we are so happy and pleased with um, his help and assistance. So thank you so much for being here with us, Sebastian. Thanks, Sarah. Our second reader tonight is Curtis Bauer. Curtis Bauer is the author of three poetry collections, most recently, American Selfie. He is also a translator of poetry and prose from the Spanish, including most recently the full-length collection poetry, um, the full-length poetry collection Image of Absence by Jeanette L. Clarionde, which won the International Latino Book Award for Best Nonfiction Book trans Book Translation from English to Spanish. Spanish to English. Spanish to English. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there was someone that popped up that I had to admit from the waiting room. Um, and Curtis is also a translator and his translations of the following books are forthcoming. Both the novel, The Home Reading Room and the book of short stories, Mothers and Dogs by the Mexican writer Fabio Morabito will be published by Other Press and the memoir, Land of Women an intimate and familiar view of the rural environment by the Spanish writer Maria Sanchez, forthcoming from Trinity University Press. Curtis is the publisher and editor of Q Avenue Press Chapbooks, the translations editor for The Common, and international advisory editor for Broken Bull Editions, the U.S. subsidiary of Vaso Roto Ediciones. He currently directs the creative writing program at Texas Tech University. Thank you so much for being here, Curtis. And you. now you two guys can take it away. All right. All right. Yeah. Curtis, you're going to read a little bit first, right? Yeah. Yeah. But we had a thought that we would um, ask each other to read specific poems and of course, the poet can refuse to read that poem, but hopefully we'll be, we'll be open. Um, I'm looking mostly at American Selfie, and I'm thinking about the poem, Returning to a Moment, mm. and then, then maybe even Selfie with Wind. They come back to back, um, but certainly returning to a moment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, this poem is actually dedicated to the memory of Jackie Bruckner, whom I met, um, I think it may have been the first time I was at Vermont Studio Center, <clears throat> um, maybe back in 2010. And uh, we were talking earlier about how VSC is one of those places where these, these friendships develop and they, they're long lasting. And um, you know, I, I kept in touch with Jackie, invited her down to Texas uh, to talk about some of her work and we attended a water conference together and and um, she's also I mean uh, is familiar was familiar with the work of one of my friends and colleagues in the land arts program uh, Chris Taylor who's here tonight 
Um, you know, so we, you know, it's, it's really amazing how these, how these friendships kind of span space and, and time. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is a poem dedicated to Jackie and it was actually published in the Oxford American, um, by, by Rebecca Gill Howell, who's also here tonight. Um, hi, Rebecca. Returning to a moment. None of this surprises you now, does it? I'm not sure I can know that. I responded to myself, or th I think I did. I should have. A friend told me to embrace my disorientation here, to attend to it and dwell in that state, make it a daily practice, like walking or drinking coffee. I've walked through this city countless times these last five months. Months ago, I couldn't distinguish bulnes from puerredon, prostitutes from neighbors on Cordoba. I was learning to walk through the nuances of this city. Everything has changed. I push into the subte. My wife still can't buy tampons. Women think protest will change something. Hope, that lingering scent jasmine blooms on a warm day, but it dissipates and I forget it ever existed. I was surprised when my friend told me she had cancer. I thought then I'd never not think of her. Tonight, Buenos Aires is a protest in response to a recent murder. A 14-year-old girl, pregnant, killed by her 16-year-old boyfriend and buried with his parents' help in their backyard. Ni una menos, not one less. I haven't thought of my friend for the last month. Maybe I've misplaced her, the astonishment that once joined me on my walks. Can we always dwell inside an unsettled state? Early on, I thought of her as I explored. The night I wrote her, her partner responded, my heart's heavy. I have to tell you, Jackie died last Friday. Death. Death. I expected hers, but I thought I'd see her again, have an opportunity to tell her about surprises, her losing lust here, losing luster. I don't know which way to turn, how to understand this. I had a stone I was going to give her, but I threw it into a pond and watched the undulations calm, erase the evidence, every ripple. Wow. Oh. Thanks, Sebastian. You know, I thought, let's <laughs> yeah. just jump right in, you know? Yeah, let's just jump right into that, you know? Yeah. Um, what's your, pro what's your I, problem, you know, man? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. It, what is, it's like revisiting an emotion. And, and this re actually reminds me of, of, uh, of another piece that maybe I'll read later on. Um, but but I was thinking about this poem and, you know, thinking you were probably going to ask me to, to, to read this. And well, anyway, I'll read Selfie with Wind and then I'll, I'll try and gather myself. And then, you know, I'll, I'll ask you to read something, Sebastian. Selfie with Wind. I was invisible today and I spoke long, eloquent sentences no one heard. The oak leaves shimmered and shrugged off the heat. It could have been dust speaking my name or the deep breath of prickly pear before it burst another bud from its spikes. But the wind didn't touch my back, tussle my hair. It was an empty word and I am empty like an oil drum rusting in the fence line of a back field, brittle, dented, more empty than an excuse given as an afterthought or permission. Tonight, a dog kissed my wrist. She was the first to address me, but the night was so deep she must have thought the air holds an echo. Maybe thought of someone who had passed hours before scenting the alley fence or an announcement of a man approaching inside the dark. Um, so Sebastian, I... I I want you to, if you could read um, 
there's a piece that you wrote that's in that's in beyond repair and i'm trying to find it in my notes here but it's it's where you're writing in response to me being in buenos aires i was thinking about that as you were reading yeah i know the piece i was going to say um I love that poem for so many reasons. I, I knew Jackie briefly when you met her. I was there and, and uh, yeah. I saw that friendship bloom and she was an amazing person. Um, and VSC is an incredible place to meet, uh, you know, artists of other, you know, media and from all over the world. And just, um, it's part of why I asked you to read it. But that line where she asks you to dwell in an unsettled state. And we talked about dislocation a lot for a while. You know, this is 2010. 2011, the next year, I had that car wreck. And one of the things that happened in our friendship was, I think, is that when I began to c- get back on my feet, there was a kind of jealousy, a kind of envy of you and Adoria were traveling, you're going to Spain, you're going to Machu Picchu. And I was like in a, you know, in a wheelchair, you know, and I, or I was like, you know, walking and I felt like, um, but then I realized that disorientation and we talked about it was it's, it doesn't really matter if you're out traveling or if you're in your, your room, you know, dwelling in an unsettled state was what we were talking about. And we, that's where we connected, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that piece is called wild. Um, yeah. That's I can read that at some point if you want me to read, Why don't it, now. You read it now. Why don't you read it now? Yeah. Okay. These are short pieces. This book is a book of, of, of short encounters. Nothing is more than a page or two, a fewer, uh, three pages, but this is one of the short ones. Wild for C. You talked to me about wanting to get higher than higher, climbing up out of the tourist realm, ahead of the wave, up early to find the elusive summit, Machu Picchu, the first world's collective wet dream of spiritual sanctuary. We were there, you say, ghosting the Lubbock streets as I trekked down into a familiar forest, dogs out ahead on the trail. Two friends back in cell phone touch. We were traveling like we did as kids, you say. I'm only mildly jealous. I can picture you in shorts and t-shirts, tipped forward by top heavy packs, sweaty and sore, moving upstream inside tourism's mundane turbulence, then dropping your load in the windowless hostel before falling into sleep like water dropped into a glass. But aren't you out also in the wilds as you talk to me, tracing routes onto those high desert streets? And aren't I too a little wild, breaking the slender spider webs along the asylum trail, the first biped to pass down this trail since nightfall? You know, there, I was thinking of that one, but the other one I was thinking of is Blue. Oh, yeah. Right? Could you read that one? Yeah, that's for you and for Vivi. And yeah. speaking of all these things we've talked about, Vivi Francis yeah. is a friend of both Curtis and I. We share her as a friend, and, and the friendships also go off in different directions. And this book is dedicated to Curtis and to Vivi. And um, this is another piece where I was kind of contemplating where my friends were and hearing about their travels. Uh, and at that time, not really being able to travel at all. And it's called Blue. Vivi writes of her recent travels in Barbados. Curtis sends me emails during his six months in Buenos Aires. She's staying in a hotel in the capital. And even though she has friends and colleagues around her and work to do in the day, still she says she's lonely, out of sorts in the midday heat. He, despite having the Spanish and having a season and being a seasoned traveler, often finds himself disoriented and confused in the wrong line, unsure of the social situation he has stumbled into. Curtis works hard, he writes, to function inside these states of dislocation and faulty translation. Each day he goes out for a walk, often finding himself in some strange quarter of the city. He notes, light, there's so much of it, even the wind is full of color this morning. When he goes into a shop and talks to the clerk, the guy seems surprised by his Spanish, even though it is impeccable and pretends not to understand. This dislocated feeling also holds true for Vivi, for whom everything feels different, new. She's 
heartened when she sees herself in some of the people who have the same gap in their teeth and appreciates how they look at her. She enjoys the fish, the spices, the clean sheets she enters for the afternoon nap. She's having a good time, which makes me wonder if displacement works better for what I'm thinking about here, or maybe I'm really talking about my own experience thrown into relief by my friend's travels, that I am, that I am displaced too, despite having been so place bound for so long and so shut in, living in a bubble, inside a bubble, inside a bubble as I do. Maybe it's the state of mind part I'm thinking of being dislocated as a form of depression or insecurity, not so much in the wrong location, but out of place inside oneself. My anthropologist friend John tells a story about being an idiot dog when you're out of your elements. You don't know the basic things to survive. You don't know what to do or how to be and thus are lost and without bearings. It's a great story I won't tell in full here, but the punchline gets enacted by an Aboriginal elder. He's trying to communicate to an anthropologist staying in his village, pointing to the sky to show him where the rainwater comes from. It strikes me that maybe Vivian and Curtis are feeling lonely, that they are wrapped up in some sort of restless state. I can only name being blue, but also could be called feeling alive. Or maybe, maybe it's just me. Sitting here on my back porch, living vicariously through them, I feel a brand of sadness that helps me inhabit my body, the kind that comes when you're out in the day, when life overwhelms, a pervasive aloneness. I'll take this blue feeling and use it to my advantage, you say under your breath. Look how good I look in blue. That's great, I love that. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I really admire about Sebastian's work is just the kind of this intense looking and observation. And I think that's something that we've, we've both kind of worked on with each other and thought a lot about and you know the there's always this reference to walking um in in a lot of our (laughs) being lost getting lost and getting into situations where you know we probably uh would shouldn't have been in but but getting something out of it um in that i mean i'm just gonna i'm gonna read a poem that uh that kind of comes out of that situation of getting lost and again a number of these poems in this book american selfie were written um in argentina um in you know another part of the americas right um but this one is called in praise of maybe uh, and it begins with a with an epigraph by ann carson which i love a foghorn sounding through fog makes the fog seem to be everything It happened walking by, thinking about what's just beyond the maybe hovering outside the reason I left, the maybe of this woman north of here I could fall in love with if the sky were bluer than the ocean every day, her first snowfall in Buenos Aires at the end of every July, that maybe, a fog I'd like to walk through, get lost in. This morning's maybe the bodies on the sidewalk under the scaffolding sprawled in such a way I'm thinking half a block away what steps I'll dance to pass between them and the dumpster, whether they will stop me, try to, or say some simple words for coins or food or even help I won't understand and therefore draw tighter the knot their attention makes around my neck. And... I don't fully see the man curled on a bare mattress, his bag, his pillow, only that he's a man who has made a home on the sidewalk. I forget him as one must in this city, or I tell myself I must, or I'm I'm to the point I don't think and instead see the bodies that worried me or children entangled on mattresses and blankets in a game of cards, the oldest maybe 12, three boys and a girl, the youngest on his belly, crisp cards perfect and gathered in his right hand, his left reaching for another, and he could have pulled at a cigarette clinging to his lip while he mumbled, and that wouldn't have surprised me. And I looked back after half a block when I heard a shout and clattering laughter and walked on. 
and on my way home from a shop where I buy coffee, I was still thinking of them, and still just enough disoriented by living in this old city, still new to me to walk one block too far and have to circle back on a different street where I saw a shoebox of cassette tapes, cloudy on a windowsill, and a deodorant stick like the one I use, in a blue Bic pen, and I saw them as out of place like me objects, and turned the corner and saw what I missed before. The sleeping man had turned on his stomach while I worried and wandered and now lay calmly, his head on his arms, a cue tattooed across one hand and a symbol on the other, a blanket covering him except his feet, which poking out from the blanket were sprouting feathers, white and soft and fluttering just so softly, I remembered the breeze beside the traffic that maybe felt like something else in his dreams. I was going to ask you to read that poem, so I'm glad yeah. you did. Yeah, it, it makes me think, um, and I want to hear kind of why you were thinking of reading it, but I also want you to maybe to read on finding myself in wrong places at some point. <laughs> yeah. um, but what I love about your poems, and obviously not all your poems work this way, but I think a kind of uh, a typical or a kind of a, a Curtis poem that I recognize is that you have this kind of associative leap that you make, that you're rooted in a walk or a experience in the moment. So that title, Returning to a Moment, kind of echoes this for me. And you, you see something and it makes you think something. And then that thought makes you think something. And then you come back to what you're seeing and you're kind of suddenly realizing maybe you're an actor in this drama that you didn't even want to be in. And it stirs some feelings or thoughts. And then you go off on those. And that kind of jumping back and forth um, is really a move that you make that I love. And I feel like I can follow your poems as they kind of drift, like you drift, it seems. And, it, and what last thing I want to say is that what I love about it is it's a doubling. It's a kind of a doubling where you're doing that on the walk or, or you seem to be, or, you're, or dramatically we're, we're watching you do that. But you're also doing it on the page and on the desk, at the desk. And, um, and I love that kind of um, little bit of narrative uh, kind of, uh, it's not drama, but it, it adds a layer of narrative to it that I think a lot of poems don't have. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that, you know, the, I use that word disorientation in there, and that's, that's one of the things that we've been talking about. Um, and we've also, you know, again, I go back to some things that I've noticed in your work about an exploration, right? As you sit down, you know, you, you might be narrating getting off of a plane, getting onto the subway instead of taking a taxi into New York City. Right? Yeah. You're doing that and you're looking around and you're kind of open to what's going on. And you report that in a way that is, you know, it could be part journalism, it could be part just observation or thought. And, and I think that our, our thought processes are, are in many ways similar, but also there's a difference, right? I mean, I, I feel like I'm lost more and I can get lost in my own work. <laughs> Whereas with yours, I, I feel like I can, I see all of this really clearly. And it's like, he's got this vision. And I, I'm always really envious of that because I feel like I just meander. And, and I mean, if, I mean, that's just the way that I am. That's kind of how I think. Yeah. And, and that's a good word. Yeah. Your poems meander. really meander, but they don't, and getting lost and meandering doesn't mean that the poems go off and, you know, they're always coming back. They're always spiraling back. Right. You're investigating a, a thought or emotion. And I get lost too, but I just don't, I just don't include those in the book. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, but the other, th I mean, I wanted you to read a couple, a couple of pieces that, um, that like you've got this, you're not afraid of, of laughing at yourself, right? And you're not afraid of making mistakes. And maybe that's because, you know, you're practiced at making mistakes, right? I mean, as and, we all are. And a little bit laughable, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking of the, of the piece Useless, right? Which I think is such a, it's, it's brilliant in that, mm. you know, it's everything that we want to say to someone, in particular, in this case, a little kid, <laughs> you know? But also, 
you know, you're in trouble for saying it and you're thinking, oh, someone's going to save me and that person who's going to save you isn't going to save you. And, but you're yeah. still putting it out there, right? Yeah. You share that. And I think that there, you've got that which is humorous, but then, you know, uh, you've, you also have, have these pieces where you're, you're willing to put yourself in a really uncomfortable situation. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a, you have another piece where you're in line at a Best Buy and, you know, someone says something that you can't abide. Yeah. And you go against your, your partner's wisdom and, and speak out about it. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there's this larger, this larger thing at work here that, that is really important. It's a real lesson about, about honesty and I think the, the obligation of writers, right, yeah. to, be, to be present and to speak up. Yeah. You know, whether, yeah. whether it's, you know, useless little girl or, yeah. you know, know your country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a great quote by Baldwin that I can't pull up just now, but he basically says that's what we're supposed to be doing as writers is to witness. Um, mm -hmm. And that's our task, you know, and he does it better than almost anybody, I think. You know, that book, um, Beginners, not Beginner's Guide, but the Beyond Repair, I think part of why I, um, and I was talking to Vivi about this, I think why I've been able to get a little bit more honest or self-effacing about some things is that it's, I, that accident that I was, was in kind of humbled me and, 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 and kind of threw me to the ground and made me re reevaluate almost every part of my life. And I looked back at part of who I was and didn't really like that person. And so when I tried to get back into the world, not only did I not want to be the same person, but I really wasn't the same person. And I also found that the world around me wasn't the same. And so the idea of um, suddenly looking at the world from a place of, you know, as a white privileged white guy, I was, I'm still that, but I didn't see the world the same way as I did. I think I saw things a little bit more clearly. And so my, bias, my privilege, all those catchwords, but they're really true, became a little more clear. I kind of watched myself kind of from behind myself. Yeah. And I watched myself make dumb moves, uh, make moves that were clearly, you know, trying to be a good guy. The moves when uh, the person didn't, you know, I, I wasn't able to, to, I shouldn't have talked to those two jerks at the code. They were being really racist and stupid, but they were trying to get me to, you know, be part of their world. And I didn't want to be a part of it. So I think that, yeah, I think the book is about kind of when you're around a traumatized world and you're traumatized, how do you connect? And, mm -hmm. and, and the only way you can connect, I think, is to start looking at what's keeping you from connecting yeah. um, and then trying to do something about it. Um, but as you know, when you're triggered and a little paranoid, you can misread situations really easy. Mm -hmm. And so well, that you... I mean, speaking of that, yeah. um, maybe you could read... Um, uh, where is it here? White men in trucks. <laughs> it's the, the beginning of the book. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, I'd be happy to. Um, it, uh, I live in Asheville, North Carolina. That's what I was talking about when I was talking about being living in a bubble inside a bubble inside a bubble. Um, it, it's this little art town up in the mountains in North Car Western North Carolina. And when I was trying to get back on, I mean, I had broken both my feet and broken my femur and I could barely walk. I mean, I couldn't walk for a long time. And when I got back into trying to be a walker, it was very hard. And I was walking my dogs and I have a really strong dog who was kind of, I basically couldn't control the dog. And so I was having a hard time on these little suburban side roads and, and these cars and trucks around me were not helping. You know, and, and I felt like there was at a, sort of a point when I was kind of being attacked and I was trying to try not to respond um, with anger and I was having a hard time. White men in trucks. What is it about them that shoots a brief goose of fear into my bloodstream? Is it imminent threat sounding in the revved engine, derision caught in the side view mirror, or plain old disdain drumming its fingers on the driver's side door? A little of each. All I know is I'm walking through our suburban neighborhood and a truck barrels past, not slowing nor moving over. Then another swerves around the bend, almost clipping my dog, meeting my upraised hands with a jutted middle finger. And another drives right up behind me and rides my bumper all the way up the hill. 
Just yesterday, downtown Asheville, a man steps around me in line and interrupts the conversation I'm having with an acquaintance. He's showing me a photo of his five-year-old boy holding up a large fish caught in one of the Biltmore ponds. The man steps in close. That a bream? He's got a smile on his face that I read as hostile. He wants me gone, but the father ignores the man, finishing his sentence about the peaceful water and how quiet it is out here with his boy. Almost mystically, he says. The man interrupts again, smile getting bigger. Hey, Mike, what are, is that a bream your boy's holding? He bursts, Mike bursts into an equally large smile. Hell no, he drawls, and lists all the fish his boy has or could have caught. I don't fish, so I don't follow, nor can I make clear sense of the quick fire exchange. The two men have fallen into a bravado-fueled, friendly back and forth. It's as if they're flashing each other's signs or showing each other their good old boy badges. I feel as though I'm being erased from the moment. No trespassing signs staked at my feet. The men chat and laugh in the corner as I slip back in line. Later, at dusk, one more truck appears. It slows to a crawl and follows me up the street. What's with people these days? Are they so sick of their lives that they need to lash out at strangers, to hate them for being something foreign or different? I turn to face my nemesis, who has rolled down the window. What do you want? The man smiles, remains silent. There's power and a comfort with silence. How old is that dog of yours? He says, leaning out the window. He's talking about the lab, just a puppy, bounding over and standing up as if seeking the man's arms. The man laughs. The look in his eyes is pure sadness. When we were talking about, about like, you know, at the end of that story, who's the, who's the jerk misreading, the, you know, the stranger, it's me, you know, um, it's easy to get caught up and easy to misread, I think. Yeah. Especially now, even more so now. Yeah. Yeah. You want to read a poem? I got one for you. Okay. How are we doing people? We're okay. All right. All right. All right. Um, do you want to read on finding myself in wrong places? I mean, I love that poem. I mean, speaking sure. of sense, of, sense of humor, yeah, I talk about, you know, your lyricism or these, but you're actually also funny and you make fun of yourself too. And, and I, and I love the situations you get into and yeah. this is one of them. Yeah. 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 So on finding myself in wrong places, like at a back corner library, Carol beside a sneezing woman drinking can after can of V8 and the tobacco chewing and spitting straw colored man with green earbuds. And then the librarians, each propping the door open with those little rubber triangles I once told a woman my father invented and that's why we're millionaires. And why prop an office door open if you're going to talk? I feel no remorse when I stand finally and go to one office and ask if the woman whispering loudly will shut her door while the other sits behind her desk. One had a cane and the other contempt in her eyes or just eyes set off by a terrible haircut. And I almost bend down to unplug that triangle from the door, but I saw myself doing it. And why would I kneel before these two women who are not quiet librarians? And on the other side, the woman has finished her V8s and two men, two more librarians had entered another office and propped open the door. And one of them, the older, wider one, asked the thin rail of a man, who do you think voted against me? What does that mean? And the other mumbled something so thin I couldn't hear it, thin like his wife, who when they walk by my house, I think of two exclamation marks. And he has, a, has cat posters hanging on his walls and the other looks angry, as if he hated those cat posters too. And then a large woman comes along after the thin man leaves and shuts the door, stubbing the little triangle with one easy kick and the door, does fill the doorway suddenly, but it has no insulation against her words and works like a magnifying glass. And I've never heard a young woman speak to an old man that way. So I was momentarily uncomfortable. And the man with the green earbuds left and another woman looked over the top of the carol wall at me as if I had something to do with it. 
and the volume grew and the big woman sounded like she was speaking out of her body and the old man was quieting, but still grasping at something as if a corner of his desk, as if he might be about to fall from some great height, a mountain in there, urgent were his words and distant like they were also following, falling. And finally she opened the door and slammed it and the mountain trembled from that slam, from that voice that might have echoed God's if you believe what Moses said, and the man and all other voices were suppressed like a flame snuffed out, and the library went back to quiet, the way that bush Moses saw became just another mountain bush. That's the Texas Tech Library. I can, you know, I can feel it. <laughs> I can feel it. Yeah, yeah. no, you really nail it. I mean, I'm not sure I know that library. I've been here maybe briefly, with, but it's like any big university library yeah. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you want to read one more? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, Sarah asked us some questions to kind of think about, and, I, and I'm thinking about our buddy Ryan here yeah. and those morning lines that we did and the, idea, and the idea of community and friends. We've mentioned some of our friends and Q Avenue. I mean, there's just some things we could go talk to that are kind of outside the books, but maybe, well, um, maybe before that, could you yeah. just read useless? <laughs> please. Yeah, of course. I mean, I set it up and, yeah. you know, not to say that you're useless, but, yeah. but, no, I can't you know, be. I mean, let's recognize the fact that, you yeah. know, we're all, we're all a little, you know, <laughs> useless at, at yeah. times. Well, one of the things about this book that actually my good buddy, um, who's been at BSC as well, Kevin McElvoy, a great writer and a great teacher, kind of a genius uh, in both. He was reading this book in an early draft and said, I don't think you realize that you have like 20 or 15 pieces with your son in them. And my boy was, uh, he's like around 12. This book kind of starts and he's kind of, he's a junior in high school when it ends last year. And um, I did, I hadn't realized it. And I realized he's a real character and I kind of added a few and kind of rewrote the book, realizing that he was a bit of a guide. And one of the themes of the book became, how do you, you know, parent a kid in this kind of time when you're racked with PTSD and struggling to even kind of get your shit together. Um, and, and when you have a boy like we do, who really is quite sarcastic and, and really is quite uh, um, sharp, you, you will get called on your, on your bullshit. And this is about that. It's called Useless. Dodgeball night at Avery's Middle School. Two girls who look like sisters oversee the ticket table in front of the gym doors. I've paid with a 20, but they only have singles. Someone's mom pats Avery on the head as he walks inside. One girl struggles to count out the bills, so the other takes over the task. You're useless, I tease. The girl's face crumbles in shame for half a second, then recomposes, replaced by a stoic frown. I've blown it. Useless is what parents say to children, teachers to students, boss to worker, coach to player. You can't catch, you can't count, can't spell, can't do anything else, right? I'm just joking, I say, leaning forward. I'm the one who's useless. I try again, really, I kid like that all the time. A dozen bills get handed back. Avery is returned, looking for me. Isn't that right? I tease you all the time. Never one to comply for compliance sake, Avery shakes his head. No, you don't. The, the mom has come back over, a worried look blooming. I stuff two singles in the tip boxes, hush money, and hurry inside. <laughs> hurry inside. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Curtis. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I see myself doing the same thing, you know. So yeah. You wrote it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, Sarah, what what were your questions? Um, I kind of I don't know if you feels right, Curtis, to kind of shift a little bit, yeah, or if, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or anyone, I mean, can ask questions if they, yeah if they have them. Well, I have a question that wasn't in the original document um, that I would just love to ask you if you don't mind. Um, you both talked about dislocation and displacement in different ways. Um, and I, I feel like it's really interesting concept 
because as, as a traveler, one, one purposefully physically dislocates oneself to go abroad and to be in a, to enjoy that level of estrangement. But then even in the U S like in the, in your work, Sebastian, like even in the U S one can feel out of touch or displaced, even driving to the, even interacting with someone in the grocery store or, or on the road, walking your dog. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering like those dislocation displacement, I'm wondering how the first person speaker provides any level of comfort or clarity or what your relationship is with the first person speaker generally in your work. Um, mm. If the first person allows uh, working through those vulnerabilities or nuances, um, do you write your best self? Do you allow that vulnerability? Um, mm. That is not, that's a very wandering question. That's a horrible first question. Um, no, I, I think it's respond good. to it as you will. I just, I'm interested in your relationship with the first person speaker um, and how it relates to your concept of dislocation and displacement. What do you think, man? I have a thought about that, but do you, do you want to go first? Well, I was, I was actually thinking uh, that you were going to answer that, <laughs> but I'm happy to. I mean, I, I was actually thinking of your of some of your pieces where you use the second person. That's what I was thinking too. To get closer to the first, to get closer to the self, right? Yeah. You are doing this, right? And yeah. And um, and I feel like that that is a it, that's a really tricky move, right? I mean, not tricky as you know, I'm going to try and pull something over on you, but it's hard to pull off, and you do it really well. And I think partially because you don't always do it, right? You've got some that are you or I, right? Yeah. And the observation. And it's this kind of in and out that I feel like you, you're able to somehow see all around the object or the subject that you're, that you're addressing. And, you know, beyond repair, I mean, what, what I think is what I would encourage, I mean, I encourage all of you, present tonight to go out and get this book, but to just think of how this is addressing uh, your place in U.S. society right now, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these pieces are written, you know, uh, during the Obama administration, entering into Trump administration. And as I'm reading them, I'm thinking, oh my God, this is, this could be, this could have been written yesterday. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, this, this worry or anxiety over who's going to win the election or not, or violence in the streets or national, you know, natural disaster, or, you know, all of these things that continue to occur. And you're not just doing that with the I, right. Mm -hmm. You're, you're the, you, brings me into it yeah right and it makes me see how how oh yeah i'm i'm also right here in this situation whether you know white guys in trucks is in Asheville or it's in lubbock texas or you know where i grew up in iowa or you know new mexico or you yeah. know wherever right yeah. you know it's so true the second person I thought of it as a way to get closer to the, get around the subject matter. Like, but it also was, I, I realized I was using it, the second person in the situations where I was trying to look at kind of what happens when there's microaggression or micro conf confusion where things culturally are askew or people are saying one thing and doing another or um, reading somebody as hostile when the person is pretending or it doesn't feel like they are being aggressive. And from a point of view of, of from my point of view, from somebody who's a privileged white guy trying to um, see it as it happens, if it's me or see it, if it happens, if it's around me to see where, you know, and so when I write about situations that I feel like are in that vein, I usually write them in the second person kind of to ask the reader to say, what would you do? You know, like, if you hear these two guys doing this kind of racist screed in the middle of a, of a Best Buy, 
do you let him do it or do you call him on it? You know, and some days I'd let him do it and I'd leave. And some days I couldn't help it. And I have to call him on it. Like, you know, what do you do when you watch somebody enact something like that? Or what do you do when you catch yourself doing it yourself? Um, and so for me, the second person, you know, is the way for me to get at that a little bit better. And I'm not sure about you. Do you use second person much or in the, you're, but you're really kind of the, heavily with the first person, but it's yeah. not always you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's not always, I mean, I, we've, I mean, I write persona poems, you know, just yeah. to try and embody, you know, to see that other perspective. So instead of the you, right, it's, yeah. it's the I as other. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, and, you know, that comes out of, you know, a love for Fernando Pessoa, for example, this great Portuguese writer who, who had all of these heteronyms or, I mean, today, like multiple personalities where <laughs> he was everyone <laughs> from, you know, this formalist to a shepherd to, yeah. you know, uh, a, a young British boy, <laughs> this weird dude. But, but what does that teach you or what does it allow us to do but to, to try to imagine, try to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else, this empathy right yeah. and i think that that's what's lacking right now in our society empathy i agree and, i agree um, yeah so it's a different way of of getting to it i think yeah so um i was wondering um what support and community those two words mean for you as writers i know that you've both had uh a long we not necessarily literary friendship, but literary family, um, brotherhood with each other as knowing each other through writing, but also as humans in the world. Um, and the term literary friendship gets used a lot, but um, before we began this conversation and reading tonight, um, Curtis, you mentioned that it feels more like literary family or just family. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if you could talk about uh, how you support each other as writers and um, how you've been able to keep writing, um, especially right now, or what your practice is in the midst of so much uncertainty. Yeah, Sebastian mentioned this earlier and, you know, our dear friend Ryan Walsh is here tonight. When we were when I was getting to know Sebastian, I was getting to know Ryan at the same time. And we started this kind of correspondence where I want to say it was for three years. It felt like it. It, it felt it was, like 20. It, was only, it was only for two months, but it <laughs> felt months. like three years. No, but we did this project called Morning Lines where every day we would each, we would send each other, you know, an observation or something that was coming from a walk. And um, it turned into this, this practice of not just writing, but communicating with each other and sharing these, you know, the everyday, something that, that popped up in front of us, or, you know, maybe I was late coming to, coming to that activity and I'd seen Ryan's and Sebastian's and somehow that entered into how I was observing the day and then writing. And that as, as this, uh, I feel like that kind of a communication is one or that kind of an activity is one that has really kept me alive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not really, we don't do that anymore. We stop doing that. And maybe we don't send each other emails every month or even every year, but you know, there is this communication where I can send something to Sebastian or, you know, others in my family that sparks an idea or sparks something, whether it's creative or it's, it's just the way life is working. <laughs> you know, what's, what it's throwing at me. And when your dog jumps off a, you know, yeah. A, yeah. Like a, a parking garage, you know, yeah. um, you know, how do you deal with that? And uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really answer your question. I'm kind of meandering around, but I feel like the, you know, how do, how does the creativity stay? I think it comes through communication and it's not, and this is my problem with the literary, 
right? Where, you know, when you think of literary friendship, that, that for me implies that it's only literary. And that's not the case, right? Yeah. Literature is much more than just sitting down and writing or reading a book. It's life. And, you know, here we are, we have lives that we share, right? Outside of our books or outside of our writing. And all of that enters into our books and our writing. Yeah. Well, I would just, my, I think Curtis was somebody who's really good at this. I mean, I don't mean that like you're, you've been cultivating it and you're talented at it. So, you know, you get an A for it, but I just think you naturally do this. Um, I think I do too, but I've always felt that as a, that I learned from you as your friendships with through Q Avenue press that we did together with Ross and Elaine and Ryan watching you in the ways you worked at the schools you teach at and um, just all the ways that you do it. It's, it is truly, I think, and for, I think for me as well, an extension of how we live. I can't do it any other way. Um, and I have friends who are not writers, of course, but for me, the, um, my core creative group are writers and artists. And I feel like they keep me sane. I think my mom's here, Marie Harris, she's a poet and her, um, she was an example too, you know, the skim milk farm, these uh, poetry workshops she did with a group of mostly women, uh, all summer, every summer for years, um, taught me that these people were serious about it. they each other's work, loved each other and were good friends all at the same time, you know, and, I think the last thing I think of is VSC. I think you go to a VSC, a Vermont Studio Center for a month and you're surrounded by people who you haven't cultivated necessarily as friends or they're not your family, but somehow they tend to be, they tend to turn into that for a month at least. And then usually you come away with a couple of friends that then become friends for life. Um, so yeah, it's more than just um, literary. It's, uh, it, it can be so much more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just made me think of something else, that idea of VSC, we were talking before about how you share meals together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talk over the over the or across the table, and you visit each other's studios, or you do this or that. And the, there's a real uh, collective vibe there. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think of Alice James books, right? Yep. I mean, that's a that's a publishing collective how it started out. And the people in that workshop that I was talking about with my mom were Alice, many of them were Alice James poets. Right. Yeah. Right. And you know, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a collect, a writing collective research collective in Lubbock. And, yeah. and I think that this is something that, that we, whether we're creating it or we're finding it, we're discovering that. And that's something that allows us to keep going, right. Finding other people who are, who are doing, either doing the same thing or interested in discovering things and trying new things. And, you know, the love escapes collective, you know, there are several members of it in this crew tonight um, that I, you know, we're, we're trying to figure shit out and, you know, <laughs> here we are doing it together, maybe failing, maybe succeeding, but there's a, there's a relationship there that is sustaining and keeps us all going. And I think that this, you know, I found that with Sebastian and Ryan and Rebecca and, you know, VSC, as, as Sebastian was saying, it's like this activity that just really is energizing. Yeah, yeah um, Chris Taylor from in the chat says that it's broader cultural support um, mm -hmm. is what um, they say. And Priscilla says that it's a decolonial kinship building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question from Kent Wilkinson, um, who asks, do either of you see poetry in the words or actions of folks on the other side of the social divide you've both referred to? If so, what forms does it take? I kind of want to ask Kent to tell, say more. Um, could you, yeah, or, um, Kent, would you like to unmute and ask your question in a um, maybe a different way, or you can drop um, more information in the chat if you'd like? No, I'll I'll do it uh, it verbally. I think you know Curtis and Chris and Adoy are probably used to these kinds of questions, but. Um, you know, there's been reference in your work and in the discussion here about, you know, these others, the white men in trucks or whoever they might be. And um, 
you know, we're in a moment where there's a lot of, you know, public discussion about trying to, you know, bridge divides and, you know, reach out. And it seems to me that that suggests needing to, you know, give and take uh, a little, little bit. And I'm just curious about as, as poets, I mean, are there things that you see from people that you might disagree with politically, ideologically, that you respect in terms of its, you know, aesthetics or its moral foundation or whatever, even if you find other elements of their orientation toward, you know, society and, and, and politics uh, disagreeable? Because I, I think if we don't start seeing, you know, value or some qualities in others, we don't, we don't get past the the divide and you know my background is in communication in fact my background is the college of media and communication <laughs> here in, in zoom uh, but you know as curtis was saying I, I think a lot of you know what you're talking about and and what you're engaging is is communication and wanting to be able to connect with others but there are these these barriers and i'm just wondering in the areas that you work in you know what yeah. you consider poetry do you see it in in, in others who you might disagree with? That's a great question, Curtis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> throw it to me. That's, that's a great thing. question, Curtis. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Beyond Repair, of what this, what this book is doing when you're talking about um, white men in trucks you know, that last part of that, of that essay where you're misunderstanding, you're misreading that and recognizing the misreading, right? I think yeah. that, I think definitely we can learn a lot from both sides, right? And I mean, how do we, how are we going to resolve issues? How are we going to, you know, get, get morality and, and honesty and care back into the way we function, it's going to be a conversation and it's going to be empathy, you know, trying to understand where someone else is coming from and, you know, how do we, <clears throat> what do we have in common? And I think that all of us have the capacity, the ability to observe, to see, to listen, and maybe as writers, what we're doing is just trying to practice that and, and, you know, practice what we, you know, being a little more observant. What can I learn from someone who has an opposing viewpoint? Well, I can listen, you know, they're teaching me to see, to try to, to try to understand another perspective. Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, I've been, these last couple of weeks, I've been having a really hard time. Yeah. Um, thinking if somebody is supporting what's going on after this, you know, the election was called one way and people are seeming to be living in a kind of deluded state or pretending to for some kind of gain, I'm really having a hard time. And I try to walk the walk and it's been difficult. Um, I'm just, I'm just thinking of it, you know, not in terms of literary or other writers, but more just like back to this being on the street, back to being open to people. I, there was a man who came to me yesterday outside of a Whole Foods and I was rushed. I was in the mood, not in the mood to deal with anybody. I didn't want to deal with them. And he called me down, called me over and it was kind of too close because of the six feet. And I was trying to, he said, you know, I'm, you know, told a story. I need to get to Washington. I need some money. What, could you help me out? And I didn't have any cash on me. I said, listen, I'm going to go into, I'm going to go in. I'll, I'll see what I can do. And he said, okay, I'll wait over here. And I went in and I got myself a sandwich and then I realized, why don't I give him a sandwich? So I got him a sandwich and I got a water. So why don't I give him a water? And then I got change. I said, why don't I just give him a five? So I got change. I was just thinking, this is what I'm supposed to do. I didn't want to do it. I went over and gave it to him. And he looked at me and he said, <laughs> very funny guy. He said, oh my God, there is a God. <laughs> and, and, he, and he was just like, thank you. And he was funny, being very funny, but he was, he was surprised. I was surprised. And, you know, I'm, I know there's a kind of like pat myself on the back part of this story, but really it was the effort to connect despite not wanting to connect. Mm -hmm. I just think we have to keep doing it or being open. Um, I'm not going to try to connect with people right now. I'm going to actually keep my head down, but I don't want to, I don't want to be one of those people who just runs away from people who seem different from them. I want to try to find a way to connect, to connect, but it's, it's hard right now. Yeah. It feels dangerous. Yeah. 
And it's and and in, I know that as a as a white guy, if it feels dangerous to me, it's oh. <laughs> it's really dangerous for a lot of other people. And so I, I that's why I get kind of pissed. I kind of feel like there's so much threat, um, and for people who have felt that threat for so long. Um, Anyway, it's a great question, and you make me realize that I'm struggling with it. I'm struggling with it. I wondered, we, we kind of hit the time limit. I don't know if you guys, people can also always just kind of just leave, but I kind of would love to hear one more piece and read one more piece, because I feel like it might be a, a little bit of a healing for me to read something that is about try, really connecting, um, uh, where, the, where, you, where the things around you make you connect. It's mm-hmm. not a willful thing. But I don't know. What do you think, uh, Sarah? Do we have time? Or yeah, I would. I would love for um, both of you, if you would like, to close uh, the reading tonight. Um, for both of you each to read a piece of your own choosing, um, sure. and then we can invite people if they want to jump off, hop off whenever. Um, okay. I'm willing to keep the Zoom open as forever, however long people want to hang out Just, tonight. Yeah. Um, and if you do have any like burning questions that if you don't get to ask this particular question, you will not have feel fulfilled by this um, writer to writer reading um, to please uh, drop them in the chat and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll answer them. So yeah, yeah um, Sebastian, do you want to go first and yeah. or Curtis or? No, Sebastian, you go first. Yeah, I think I set myself up, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is called useless. No, no, I'm just <laughs> Um, you mentioned it that's why I thought of it Um, it's a piece called Gospel I'm sorry where is it when I began to finally get out of my you know wheelchair and then getting out of you know all the different things he had to get out of to get back up from a major wreck and and struggling with kind of learning not wanting to drive not wanting to be around people not wanting to all that stuff, I began to finally travel. And like you said, I, when I went to New York, I was kind of, okay, I have a little extra money. I'm just going to take, like I usually, I'll take a cab. I'll get, I won't, you know, I won't deal with the bus. I won't deal with, then I thought, no, 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 take a subway, you know? Yeah. And so I went, and this is about taking a subway into, into Manhattan for the first time after many years. Uh, I mean, three years since I'd been there. Gospel, just landed at JFK, about to head into Manhattan for the first time in a while. Instead of flagging a car or jumping into a van, I follow the signs to the air train, three stops to the A-line, joining a huddle of men and women on the cold and gray platform, wind shuttling in. What about that cold embrace speaks to my bones? What about this Congress of strangers? The whole ride, letting the wider world in, not looking up, just listening to the bodies around me settle into the silence, only glances allowed, brief encounters with faces. Train car slowly filling, dipping down into the long, dark tunnel. A young man enters the car and introduces himself. I'm not here to bang you or bore you, he sings songs. I'm here to sing to you, brothers and sisters. Of course, no one looks up, nothing spectacular in this scenario, though the man beside me leans down and opens his stance a notch. He turns his face to hear our singer, nodding as he climbs the verbal steps up onto his soap, soapbox. I don't do r and I don't do rap. All I see for now are his red sneakers, his nervous strut back and forth. People, I sing gospel. The train pushes further through Queens, and even though the young man's flock heads into their days wrapped up in headphones and handhelds, I can see the car tune into the sweet singing. It's all in the eyes, people trying to figure out what exactly is happening, how much effort they will be required to put forth in response. One middle-aged man even gets up and moves further down the car. There is no friend like Jesus, the young man, the young performer belts. The congregant beside me nods a fraction. We're approaching a stop. The song is through. There's a moment to ad lib, so a brief bio gets offered up. I'm only 26. I've banged and boozed. I've seen it all. My seatmate slips a few coins into the man's hand as he offers up a little fist bump of thank you. A tired looking trans woman stares at me as I watch the show. I've, I've been shot three times. Someone laughs out loud at the back of the car. This makes our young pastor smile and he turns to engage the commentary. I want to give the man a dollar. I want to offer up some thanks of my own. But I stop myself, not wanting to make my first overt act in the city, be reaching for bills in a tight front pocket. He drifts off to his next stage. 
My seatmate gets off at the next stop. The car fills with a new surge, and in the next length of time, I give my thanks by humming quietly in my body, letting in as much as I can, offering praise to this daily gathering of bodies and faces, lives, glances, mute stares. I'm here to sing, the young man said. It makes me want to cry. I lower my head instead and fall deeper into my seat, letting the woman beside me settle into my shoulder. Soon we'll be under the river and I'll step out into the great canyons of wind and light. But for now, here, I will quietly sing into my own breath. Thank you. Beautiful. Thanks for reading that, Sebastian. Um, I'm going to read one that I, I was thinking, I haven't, I haven't read uh, in a long time. And it, it was, well, it's, yeah, it's a little connected to white men in trucks, I think. But it's the different men in different vehicles, <laughs> I guess. Is that what uh, it's called? Yeah, that's what it's called. Uh, a sound like a river. There's a stretch called nothing between Carlsbad and El Paso. And I'm thinking while my wife is in the back seat with Ibai, that the SUV we passed 40 or 50 miles back driving and stopping through town might have taken some offense with my gaze and smirk. And in the miserable night, this has become in Southern New Mexico, lit only by its headlights in my rear view mirror, where I see the dog in my wife's arms ready to vomit on her and the leather seats. And we are close to the border and close to being farthest from everything known and no one knowing where we are. Aren't we every day on some edge of disappearing somehow? And maybe Vi feels that menace too. And vanishing is her first memory. Or maybe she only has to pee and wants the dark curves to flatten out. Sometimes when she sleeps, she looks like she's running. And then she's swimming or flailing that first swim of hers out of the valley stream she was thrown in with her brothers and sisters because rushing water washes away what some men want to disappear. And her litter mates disappeared under a dark sound. And we call her what the Basque call river because Erika was too harsh for the puppy she was then. And who could shout it anyway? In that moment, she must stop chasing a moth drop some blue bumblebee pacifier she's found in the street, or if she's shitting on the bed. Tonight, the wind rushes through the open window like stream water does down mountains. A resonance in the dark she wants to run from, but can't. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I see Kathy saying... Kathy's saying that she uh, remembers Jackie Bruckner and misses her too. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks, gonna, everybody. If you don't, yeah. you haven't bought their books yet, I'm going to drop in a little link. Um, I also dropped in um, both websites for both of our authors. Um, and then... I did want to let you all know that we have some more virtual events happening um, on Vermont for Vermont Studio Center. Um, they're all free and open to the public and um, we couldn't be here without the support of our donors and our funders and our board um, and all of you. So thank you for being here with us and for feeling like um, we can connect across many miles and many different time zones, and um, especially during this time. Mm. So thank you so much. Thanks, Curtis. Thank you, thank Sebastian. You. Thank you, Sarah. Curtis, that was fun. Yeah, it was great to see you. Yeah, and everybody, thanks for all. coming. Thank you, friends. It's great yeah. to see you all. We'll talk soon, brother. Yep. All right. <laughs>